So the majority of the time, my notes stay to the side. This week, the sermon wrote, not that I feel like reading from it or feel called to read from it, but when the sermon writes, I need to respect that. The second scripture reading comes to us from the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the people of faith in Rome. What then are we to say? What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly, be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. The life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies, to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. May God's blessing continue to flow through and abound from the experiences of Scripture. May it guide the meditations of our hearts and the words of my lips on this day. I said the sermon wrote itself. That was Tuesday. Different world. Paul opens this section of scripture, and it's worth considering Romans in a larger setting, but uh, to read the whole letter and then have a sermon on it seems to be a little ambitious. So Paul opens this section with a, a phrase of worth noting, what then are we to say? So he's been talking about something before, he's been talking about sin and grace beforehand, the abundance of God's grace and the ability of God's grace to overcome sin. And what then are we to say? Paul is bringing us into a conversation. Paul has imagined a conversation partner who is going to counter-argue or to take a what seems like logical leap with what Paul is doing. And what then are we to say? It's a way of saying, and the point is, now we might be able to you know, connect with that feeling, right? We've gone through various obligations in life and opportunities. We might have listened to something. <clears throat> we might be doing it right now. We might have read something. We might have watched it. And at the end, we thought to ourselves, so what? And the point is, we might have gone to a movie, and when it was done, we sat there thinking, I'm not getting those two hours back. <laughs> we might have felt the same way about a meeting we've been at. So what? What 
Therefore shall we say to this. Paul is bringing us in to this back and forth conversation. Because Paul has said, grace is abundant enough to cover all sins. The grace of God can handle anything that we have done when we miss the mark. Good archery term to describe sin. We have missed the mark. Our trajectory might have looked true, but we did not land where we should. Or, if you're like me at the rifle range, there was no hope of hitting the target to begin with. I wasn't allowed to do rifle shooting in Boy Scouts because I could get the targets on either side of mine. <laughs> Hamarta, to miss the mark. Paul says there is grace enough from God to reset the trajectory, to get us where we need to be. And the argument that he is setting up, the straw argument, is if grace is good, right? If grace is good, then more grace is better. That's a pretty sound argument, right? That sounds like good, solid logic to me. If grace is good, more grace is better. If one brownie is good, then surely nine of them is... No, it's not. <laughs> not even close. We should scoff at the argument, and that's what Paul is laying out, an argument that is, in its own way, laughable. Right? We should scoff at this. If there's enough grace to cover our sins, then we must sin more so we can get more grace and God is glorified. We should scoff. And yet, this sort of theological leap of logic has been made by people of faith for a very long time. Paul doesn't invent the argument. It's out there already. People of faith in Christ who have believed in good faith that they were predestined, chosen, set aside from the beginning of time to be a people saved, there have been portions of that population who have chosen to believe that because they are saved, because they are beloved, because they are set aside, they can do whatever they want and grace will abound. Let's party like it's ancient Rome. Because God will be glorified because more grace will abound. Right? More sin, more grace. It works out. Who cares if we are denying the humanity and the divinity within us and within others when we're doing it? Because, Paul, I'm going to tell you, if there's grace enough, then more grace is more better. Yes, I butchered English on purpose to tell you how silly the argument is. So Paul answers this straw argument in two ways. The first is a very practical one. It's the one that jumps to our mind whenever we hear arguments that we scoff at. You must be kidding. God forbid. Paul, I got an idea. Let's sin more so that God can pour more grace out on the world. And Paul says, are you off your rocker? Hey, Paul, let's miss the mark on purpose so that God can do more to correct our path. And Paul says, have you lost your ever-loving mind? Hey, Paul, sin party in my house. God will be blessing abundantly. And Paul says, is that lump in your throat your nose? Dot, dot, dot. It's the one that jumps to mind first. It's the practical one. It's the one that we would all know. But then Paul builds upon this response to this whole sin-grace in equation that the logic seems to be putting together. He says, more importantly than the fact that you need to be, what's the saying? Bless your heart and your little pointy head. Besides the fact you need that to be done to you, Paul is saying we need to remember something far more than God forbid. 
we need to be who we are. You've got to be you. And if we recall, just in the fifth chapter last week, Paul is saying, you, we, I'm part of this too, are justified, made righteous, and faith-filled. So it could fall under the, um, didn't someone raise you better than that? When you argue more sin, more grace? But Paul isn't talking just about our upbringing. Paul's not just making reference to the adults in our lives who lovingly shepherded us to this place. The peers in our lives who watched out for us and challenged us and pushed us to, to cultivate us in faith. Paul's not just talking about where we came from. But Paul's talking about a choice that we made that has us here in this moment. Now, we might not be able to remember our baptism, right? We might not be able to. Some of us were small, angelic, nay, beatific when we were baptized. October's a good month to be born, by the way. But I do remember the time that people invested in me to, to help form me in faith. I remember the many occasions when I have clung to God, even when I was looking to be separated from the church. Paul says, remember, be who you are. So Paul is moving under the understanding that the people of faith there in the house churches of Rome, these people of faith have gone through a public practice that proclaims an inward faith. Paul believes that these folks have been baptized. And Paul has an image and understanding of baptism. Paul is talking about immersion. Now, I was sprinkled as a beatific baby. Paul is talking immersion. And baptism is different things to different people. It can be sprinkled. It can be, it can be an immersion. It can be as an infant. It can be as an adult. It ranges all across the spectrum. Not just within Christian communities, but in non-Christian traditions. The ritual washing that takes place. Paul says, be who you are. Be a baptized person. Understand what you have gone through. Because for Paul, baptism is something quite specific. It's not the washing away of sins like the Gospels tell us. No, Paul says when we are baptized, we are laid into the grave. Covered over by death itself. We go through a Good Friday experience on our own. And unless the person um, has a personal vendetta against you, or is patently unaware, after a brief pause, we are raised up again. For that is the experience, isn't it? John Dunn talks about it in his Holy Sonnets. We go from life to life and there is a comma, a brief pause. And when we are raised up, Paul says, we are raised up into Christ's new life after that pause of breath. And so if we are indeed reborn this way, as Paul lays it out, then we are something that is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, and holy, H-O-L-Y, different from what we were before. We don't go back the way we came. That's why there's two sets of steps in baptistry. You don't go back the way you came. We don't seek the life we had. That life has been killed till it died from it. Be who we are, Paul says. Remember. Remember the commitment, the covenant bonding that has taken place. But don't remember it as some sort of historical moment, right? We have those things. We have those moments that we mark in life, anniversaries, 
and things along those lines. We remember and we celebrate them as well. We should. But Paul is saying, no, we're not looking to remember a historical moment. We're not going to get all misty-eyed. Like when I go through a photo album and I confirm, yes, indeed, there is the glow of God emanating from that cherub boy's face. You scoff. It was there. You just got to squint. That's all. Paul is telling us, be who we are. Be who we are supposed to be. As we live our lives out, be who we are. As we go forth into the world proclaiming the gospel, be who we are. As we dream our dreams, face our fears, as we shoulder the sky and kvetch a chaos. We should all kvetch a little bit in life. It's a good Yiddish term. Embrace it. So we kvetch a chaos. Be who we are. And we will scoff at notions like sin more so that there might be more grace. We will scoff at notions that say certain lives are less worthy than others. We will scoff at notions that say the things that we have been entrusted with are ours to use as we see fit as if no one else has them. Paul is also telling us something else. Paul is also calling us to realize something that's hard for us to do as disciples. The disciples of Christ on the American frontier in the 1800s, a very democratic movement. We're going to be celebrating that later on today. We're going to be celebrating the way we function as a congregation, as a people of faith called to mission and ministry. In Paul's world, in the ancient Roman world, the idea of doing that sort of thing wasn't totally unimaginable, but it was pretty darn close to it. So when Paul tells us to be who we are, to understand that, bath, that baptism is a death that connects us to the death of Christ, and when we are brought up from the waters, we are brought up in the faith of the resurrection itself, that we are bound to a community of Christ, that Jesus, that love is building. Paul also is telling us that we are gods. Not we are gods, little g, but we belong to God. We talk about covenant relationships and the disciples, and it's often very flat sort of thing. We enter into them together. We, we understand sort of this that we are on an even playing field relationship-wise. Well, there, there's a picture out there that I want you to imagine. After World War II, during the, the Marshall uh, Plan, we sent uh, livestock over to Europe to help rebuild. And uh, there's a picture out there of a mule. We know what a mule is, right? And, and we sent it to Greece. And in Greece, they farmed with donkeys. Mule donkeys. And there's a picture of this mule that is yoked to a donkey. Now I'm using the mule and donkey language because both God and human beings are stubborn animals when it comes down to it. But if you can imagine that yoke team, if you ever dealt with a mule and a donkey together, you know which one is going to be driving the team. The good people on the farm figured out very quickly that the plow was going in circles because the donkey just cannot do what the mule can do. No matter what the donkey thinks, it cannot do what the mule can do. And that's where Paul is taking us. Paul is reminding us we belong to God as well. And we need to appreciate the difference, the inequality in that relationship. God can do things we cannot do. Like provide grace abundant enough to save us from our sins. Like raise us up to new life when we have been laid down in the waters of death. God is God. And we are who we are. 
we get to be, thanks be to God, church today. Amen.